morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. A uh, beautiful day that the Lord has made. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just um, come before you this morning. As we open your word, I ask that you would just speak to each and every heart here today um, through your word, um, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the last, uh, last month, we were uh, looking at spiritual gifts and the fact that our gifts, or what we have been given, are to be used and shared with others, not hoarded for ourselves or for our own blessing. Uh, this um, topic led me to look into the life of Joseph in Genesis, who is a fantastic example of one who used his gifts for the good of others. Um, I think that Joseph gives us a very good pattern also for true success in life. And I would define true success as finding and doing God's will for your life. Uh, this, do, doing that, finding and doing God's will, uh, will result in, in the end for the Lord to say to you, well done, you good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, right? If, if you're doing God, if you're finding and doing God's will, that is an inevitable uh, result. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So what, on a practical sense, this means is that true success is going to look at least a little different for each one of us, right? Because we're, we're all different people. God's will for us is not exactly the same other than certain broad things like we're all to love, our, love the Lord our God and love our neighbor. That's God's will. But I'm talking about in a practical sense, right? It's going to look at least a little different for each one of us and very possibly very different for many of us as we seek after uh, God's will and what he wants us to do. Um, this is, I think, a, a very important idea for us to comprehend and to keep in mind as Christians because our world and our culture tends to define success in a very narrow way, right? If you, if you, if you kind of aren't following this, well, you're not really successful, right? The world tends to define true success in terms of prestige, power, position, wealth, and generally an easy or luxurious lifestyle, right? And that's, 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 there's not much else that the world calls success. Um, Matthew 23, 11 says that the greatest among you, however, shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted, right? The world says success is leadership being in the spotlight, Jesus says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. The world says, uh, success is exalting yourself, right? Get in that position. Uh, Jesus says, whoever humbles himself will be exalted by God. And when we look at the life of, life of Joseph, even when Joseph was exalted, right, from the prison, the dungeon, <laughs> up to the position uh, of second in authority in Egypt, even at that point in time, he was still the servant of all, wasn't he, right? Because he was put in charge of gathering all the food for the coming famine and then distributing all the food to all the needy and hungry uh, people to keep them alive. So even when Joseph was exalted, he was still servant of all, right? Uh, and this idea of servanthood is generally not part of, of the world's definition of success, is it? Mm, not really. Uh, however, it is an integral part of true success in God's eyes, especially because God considers our service to others as service to him. We looked last week, and we're going to look again, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, which says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. 
And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. But then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed and feed you or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. So serving and helping and giving to others is doing it for the Lord, for Jesus, for God our Savior. <laughs> but one of our biggest fears is that if we spend our lives serving others and giving to others, we'll end up with nothing for ourselves, right? Right? Uh, this, however, we know is also wrong thinking, as Jesus said in Matthew 6.30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, do not worry then, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So if we are giving our lives, serving the Lord and serving others, he's going to take care of us. He's going to meet our needs, and we don't have to worry that we're going to end up in the gutter because we gave everything away serving and helping others, right? Um, so today I want to talk about, uh, a little more about, uh, three keys to true success in life. And by saying that, I'm not saying that these are the only three keys or that, um, this is the only formula or the formula. Uh, so, so don't get that idea. What I'm just saying is that I know that these are <laughs> three of the keys at least. All right which are seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness, right? That's number one. Serving the Lord and serving others, which is serving the Lord, which is serving others, right? And humbling oneself, okay? Seeking the Lord, his kingdom and his righteousness, serving others and serving the Lord and being humble. Three keys. If you are striving after these three things, it doesn't matter also if physical wealth or prosperity ever come to you like they did to joseph right they did they did come to joseph but because god is going to take care of you right so so we're not saying that this is a promise that you're going to end up as wealthy as joseph was uh, but god will take care of you and and all along remember that the greatest honor why we're doing this why are we seeking first you know the lord his kingdom is because because it should be our ultimate goal at the end of our life to hear, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So even if we were to end up in the gutter, and you, and you could probably find the testimony, and I can, uh, some Christian that maybe appeared to end up in, doesn't matter if we're serving the Lord, if that's, we're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So there's also one more principle I think that will help us in this journey, uh, which is the principle of contentment. Hebrews 13.5 says this, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So uh, as, as, we, as, as we do this, 
And that's, that's the problem then. As, as we're serving others, maybe we see others being promoted, like Joseph. He's 30 years old in the prison. He could become discontent. Say, well, Lord, is this it? My life in the prison forever, right? Uh, contentment versus greed will help us to persevere as we continue to serve the Lord, knowing that he's got an ultimate plan. We don't know what that plan's going to be. Could have been the plan for Joseph to stay there forever. He, you know, he didn't know. We don't know. But it wasn't. So anyway, uh, whatever the case, wherever God has us, we just continue to be content. We don't demand, well, I'm 31 now, Lord. It's time to move on, right? We don't demand. We stay content. So today I want to uh, begin um, to look at some of the examples from Joseph's forefathers. Um, As I was reading through Genesis here, there were quite a few other examples that stood out in a very similar way to the story of Joseph and also I believe actually would have set examples for Joseph so that he did know how to live that this wasn't just um, you know, random thoughts that came to, to Joseph to, to do this way that he actually saw the same pattern in his forefathers and then he was responding to um, and continuing on with the same type of behavior um, so the first person that I want us to look at today is, is Abraham, which was Joseph's uh, great-grandfather. In Genesis 12, we have the first mention of Abraham. This is before God changed his name. So most of the scriptures I'm going to read today is going to refer to Abram. I'm probably going to keep referring to him as Abraham because his name was changed. And it's a little confusing, but anyway. So, so scripture is going to say Abram. This is Abraham simply before God uh, did change his name. Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. So the first thing I want us to notice here, as as God speaks to Abraham and tells him that he's going to bless Abraham, (laughs) but he also tells him the purpose as to why he's going to bless Abraham. He says, so that you can be a blessing. Right? He says right there, in fact, he says, so that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham's gifts and the blessing that were going to come to Abraham was not for the purpose of Abraham's enjoyment or his self-fulfillment. It was, it was clearly stated in the first thing God ever told him, so that you can be a blessing. That's going to come in the form of serving others, giving, sharing. That's what Abraham was to do. Uh, Secondly, Abraham is told to embark on a long journey to move to a foreign land, and the exact destination is not even revealed to him. He is just told that it will be shown. (laughs) It will be shown. Now, uh, this... Abraham's obedience then, it says he he immediately left. (laughs) Amazing, right? He immediately left. Uh, This demonstrates that Abraham was seeking first God's kingdom, right? Uh, Abraham's kingdom was in Haran. He was wealthy. He had a lot of possessions. He was established. That was Abraham's kingdom right there, right? If we want to, you know, use the term kingdom. But Abraham was willing to uh, forsake all that. Right, and I'm sure Abraham's neighbors. Let's let's think of in the terms of success here. Hey, Abraham, what you doing? Looks like you're packing up. Yeah, we're moving. Oh, really? Where are you moving to? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm going a long way to a foreign land. God told me to go. Right? Okay. So this is not 
part of the worldly keys for success, what Abraham was doing, right? He was established, he was wealthy, he was doing very well where he was at. He's going to a place, that, first of all, he doesn't even know exactly what place he's going to, and secondly, we know from reading onward, in this place he had no connections, no family, no support system, no nothing. That, that's, not, that's not the recipe for worldly success, right? No, it is not. Uh, however, again, Abraham was seeking first God's kingdom, so he obeyed. In Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that Abraham understood that he was seeking actually a heavenly destination, right? Not looking for a city which had actual foundations in this world, but a heavenly city. So he obeyed. He obeyed, and it demonstrates that he was seeking first God's kingdom. Um, In Genesis chapter 13, uh, then Abraham uh, goes to the land of Canaan. He moves around a little bit. He goes down to Egypt for a short while, comes back. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2, we're going to pick up the story. It says that Abraham, Abram, was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. <laughs> so even during all this uh, dangerous journey, and, you know, when he's journeying, when he's journeying, he's probably not making money. He's just spending it. Most of us know that from trips, right? That's what happens on trips. You don't really make money, you spend it. But yet, here, God's taking care of him. He's still uh, very well off. Um, it says in verse 3, he says, He went on his journeys from the Gev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, that's when he first came to Canaan, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And then Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for the possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Right? And this is a very godly principle we read in the New Testament. We're not to fight and be angry and have strife. Right? So what was Abraham doing? He was seeking God's righteousness. Right? Right? We need to settle, we need to settle this issue. We've got strife between our herdsmen. He said in verse 9, Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. So they're standing on a hill. Abraham takes Lot up there. They look over the land. And he says, Look, Lot, you choose. You pick left or right, doesn't matter to me. I'll choose the other. I'll take the other. And verse 10, it says that Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself the valley of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from one another. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners before the Lord, against the Lord. And so we see here the fact that Abraham offered Lot the first choice shows that he wasn't seeking first his own kingdom. If Abraham was seeking first his own kingdom, he wouldn't give Lot the choice of the best, right? He would have taken the choice. And, and if I was Abraham, I could tell you, I could have thought of a hundred reasons to just make the choice, right? I mean, God told me to come to this land. I'm the leader, nephew Lot. Uh, you know, I... I I could, I could probably go on the rest of the day for good reasons as to why, I, you know, it makes perfectly logical sense here now. I'm going to choose Lot, and you need to take your place, nephew, and, what, you know, whatever else. But Abraham was giving. He was giving. He gives Lot the choice of the best whatever you want, Lot. Go right ahead, 
It's amazing. He wasn't seeking first his own kingdom, and he knew that God would take care of him. Right? In the very next verse, 14, the Lord said to Abram, okay, I'm, this is just, I'm not skipping verses in between. The next verse, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Abraham gave it, gave it away. The next verse, God says, Abraham, just look around, including eastward where Lot just chose. He says, Abraham, I'm going to give it all to you and to your descendants. You think you gave it away. <laughs> I'm going to give it back to you. I mean, that's what God is saying here. God is taking care of him. He said in verse 16, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth and then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise and walk about the land through its length and its breadth, for I will give it to you. And I can't help but think that this was part of God's simply reward, you know, test what are you going to do? Are you going to look, are you going to be selfish and think about your own kingdom first? No, he wants peace, peace with Lot. He says, go ahead, Lot, take whatever you want. God turns right around and says, oh, okay, Abraham, but I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> Right? Amazing. Again, what Abraham did was not a recipe for worldly success. You don't give away the best land if you want to be truly successful. Right? That's not, not, that's not how the world operates. Again, he was seeking first God's righteousness. Let's not have strife. Thinking of others first. He was sharing. He was giving away. And he was being content instead of being greedy. He had plenty, right? He had plenty already. And he was really, truly following this recipe for true success. Now then, in the very next verses, um, the king of Sodom, where Lot chose to settle and get a home in the city of Sodom, this, uh, the king of Sodom go, gets into a war and he is defeated and Sodom is looted and Lot is captured by a foreign king and hauled away. <laughs> In Genesis 14, 14, we read this. When Abram heard that his relative Lot had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods. He also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and all the people. Then after returning from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, also brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram and said to him, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. And I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Aner, Eshgal, and Mamre, let them take their share. Wow. So here, uh, Lot immediately gets in trouble in Sodom. Sodom is defeated. <laughs> Lot is captured and hauled away. Abram, as soon as he hears it, risks his life. Risks his life to rescue Lot. When he did that, was he thinking of himself first or others, right? I mean, he could have said, well, boy, I guess that was <laughs> just... <laughs> Lot made his choice and ugh, it happened, God's will. <laughs> it 
No, Abram takes his men and, and a few of his neighbors here, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, and they go after these guys and, and they, they literally fight and risk their lives to rescue the people of Sodom and especially his nephew, Lot. Abraham was not thinking of himself first. He did what was, again, best for Lot. <laughs> and then, as he's coming back with, with all the possessions, Abraham meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek comes out and meets... Actually, so two kings come out to meet Abraham in the same one verse apart. Melchizedek and the king of Sodom, right? And, and Melchizedek blesses Abram, and then Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything he owned, right? That's the tithe. Again, what, what was Abraham doing again? Giving stuff away again, right? He was literally gave away a tenth of all he had to whom he, this man, priest that he recognized to be a priest of God, Melchizedek. And then the king of Sodom says to him, you know, just give me the people, but you can keep all the loot, right? It was, was Sodom's loot, but it was just for Abraham. He says, uh, king of Sodom says, you know what, just, and Abraham again could say, well, well, there's my reward right there, right? I just gave away a tenth to Melchizedek, and how near how, here now God has given me all the booty uh, of Sodom. And yet Abram, um, again, recognizes the wickedness of Sodom. Now, it's interesting, in the previous chapter, um, when he went down to Egypt for a little while, he received some gifts from Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it's not that Abram's principle simply was, I will never receive any gift from anyone. Because he did receive some gifts from the king, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But from the king of Sodom, he says, I will not take a thing, not a single thing. I think because he recognized, again, the wickedness of Sodom, and it was the source of this wealth, he simply wanted nothing to do with it. Again, Abram not seeking for, his, seeking for his own kingdom, his own wealth. He could have taken all this loot. He simply refused it. He risks his life for Lot and then turns down the prize, right? All the, all the wealth. He says, now, Aner, Eshkel, and Mam, he says, let them take their share. That's fine. But as for me, I will not. And as far as Lot, I'm sure that he had good reasons because... <laughs> because what immediately happens next is that the people of Sodom and Lot himself just simply resettle in their town, their city of Sodom, right? Um, Lot probably had, I'm sure, great reasons to make his home in the city of Sodom. I'm sure it was much easier than living out in the tents like he had previously been doing, like Abraham. Uh, the shopping was easier. I'm sure there are many conveniences of the city of Sodom. And it was also pray, uh, probably a great place to make good business connections because, again, Lot had all these great herds and, and everything. But, but it was well known and stated multiple times already here in Genesis that it was known as an exceedingly wicked and sinful place. And so the question is, was Lot seeking first God's righteousness? Now, we have to read between the lines, but I would say probably the answer is no. And as a result here, Lot is about to lose everything. Um, in the very next chapter, God sends two angels to visit Sodom. He said to test them so he would know if the wicked outcry was as the Lord had heard. And the uh, men of Sodom fail the test and God decides to destroy Sodom and all the surrounding cities in this valley. And yet God is compassionate and decides still to rescue Lot. And in Genesis 19, 12, uh, the two angels said to Lot, whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons, your daughters, whatever you have in this city, bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. 
So this, this, this was the angel's message to Lot. We are going to destroy this place. The wicked outcry is so great that God has sent us to destroy. He says, take whatever you've got and flee the city. The next verse, 14, says, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters. And he said, get out of this place for the Lord is going to destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. <laughs> it was a big joke. And when morning dawned, Lot had not yet left. Right? The sons-in-laws had refused, and Lot was still dilly-dallying within the city. It says, when morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. He hesitated even up to the last minute. Now he, he's got all night to get ready and leave. He went to his sons-in-law to try to convince them to leave, but he's still not leaving himself. And it says that he hesitated. And I can only think that that hesitation probably had to do with all his stuff, right? Everything was there. He was a rich guy. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters. <laughs> Fortunately, there was two angels and there was four people, so they each had a hand. <laughs> and it says they brought them out and put them outside the city. And when they had brought them outside, one of the angels said, Escape for your life. Don't look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. What? Oh no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness which you have shown to me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains for the disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there instead. Is it not small that my life may be saved? Wow. Lot did not want to do things God's way. Right? He wanted to do it his own way. What does this tell us about Lot? Was he seeking first God's kingdom and God's righteousness? Or was he seeking first his own way? I mean, he literally argues with the angels. I mean, we, wouldn't we all die to hear a word from an angel of this, like, what our, our God's will for our life is? <laughs> the angel says, now listen, you go to the mountains, escape there, and you're going to live. And Lot says, no, no, I can't do that. I won't do that. I don't want to do that. I want to go to this little city. Isn't it small? It'd be much. That's a much better plan. Amazing. Amazing. Except I think that it probably demonstrates what the attitude of Lot's life was. He wasn't used to seeking first God's kingdom, obeying the Lord, thinking of doing God's will in every step of his life. So he argues and he says, no, I want to do it this way. He was, he was literally shown God's will and said, no, I have a different plan. However, in verse 21, the angel said to him, behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry and escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. And the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the valley, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of all the cities and what grew on the ground. Which means that all the livestock, all that green, nice green grass, <laughs> gone. And then it says, but Lot's wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now, 
Verse 27, Abraham rose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overflow throw when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. In the very next verse, then it says that Lot went up from Zoar, that little town of which he begged to stay because it had to be this way. It says that Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. And he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Right? This led to further disaster and ancestral relationship and the beginning of the nations of Moab and Ammon, enemies of Israel. Lot wouldn't go to the mountains because God told him, but he would go to the mountains after he stayed in Zoar a while and he got afraid of what was going on there. <laughs> Lot's greedy choice to take the best of the land resulted in a total loss. He ended up with two daughters in a cave in a mountain. Abraham's humble choice to take what was left over was blessed. So, in Genesis chapter 22, we see the pattern of Abraham's life. Seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness, right? Constantly giving. Abraham was giving and giving. He understood that he was to be a blessing. But there was one more thing that God wanted to see if Abraham would give. Genesis chapter 22. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And God said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And he said to the young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on the back of Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked on together. <clears throat> and they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to, to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham did not withhold anything from God. He gave all including his son, to be used in any way God wants for God's will for others. Our challenge is the same. Will we give everything to God and others? We don't have to be afraid. He'll take care of us. Our time, our energy, where we live, our lifestyle, Will we withhold anything from God? 
God doesn't just want to take stuff from us. Now, there may be something that God says, son, daughter, you don't need that. (laughs) But God doesn't just want to take stuff from us, but he wants us to allow him to use our stuff for his plan, for his will.